Hi, good morning. Good morning. How's it going? I don't know who did the voiceover for that baptism video, but <laughs> solid set of pipes there, my friend. Well done. Well done. As, uh, when I was in college, I actually had just graduated college, uh, my, but, my best friend and I uh, had decided we wanted to do a mission trip together. And we had done a few mission trips in college separately. I had gone to, to China and to Nicaragua. He had gone to Malaysia a couple times. And so we decided we were going to keep it stateside and we were going to do a trip together. Well, because uh, we, we had a connection in California with, and I'm not making this up, the Motherload Baptist Association <laughs> in California, we decided we were going to go and work in California together. But rather than fly, we were going to pile in my 98 Honda Civic and we were going to drive from Atlanta to Sacramento, California. Well, a couple of my, of my buddies, who were all still really close friends, uh, who are less spiritual, obviously, than we were, they wanted to come for the road trip, but not for the mission trip part. They piled in with us, and so four college-age men uh, started a trek across the country. And we hit Memphis, St. Louis. Uh, we drove through Kansas, uh, which was kind of uh, odd now looking back to think I may have driven by my wife's house and not known that she was there. Uh, through Denver, stopped in Vegas, and then on up, uh, yes, before the mission trip, we stopped in Vegas. <laughs> And then we went uh, to San Francisco and then dropped our buddies off in, in, in Sacramento. And the reason why we were able to do this was because we had freedom and opportunity, right? We had freedom and opportunity. We had freedom because I had just graduated college and my next step, which at the time I wasn't quite sure, was actually seminary. And so I hadn't started that yet. And they were still in school. And so they just had the summer off. So we had freedom to do that. No commitments really on our lives. We also had the opportunity. We had a reason to go to California. And we took it. We kind of seized that, that chance that we had. But if I were to call my friends today, uh, about 10, 12 years later, and say, hey, guys, why don't we get the band back together? Why don't we go recreate the road trip? Uh, one of them's in North Carolina, one's in South Carolina, one's in Georgia, and then I'm in Texas. We all have families. Uh, one of my buddies is a Marine fighter pilot, so he has other trips to take uh, right now, and he gets there a lot faster than you would in a 98 Honda Civic. <laughs> they would all tell me no. God, Travis, we can't do this. We don't have the opportunity to do it. We don't have freedom to do it. There's no reason to go. Are we going to have to drive back together? Where, whose car are we going to take? Where are we going to meet up? Are you going to come back to Atlanta and then drive forward? What are we, how are we going to do this? And I think when it comes to serving Christ, we have a similar attitude and approach. We look at our lives. We see how full they are and full of good things, not necessarily bad things, families, friends, commitments that we've made, maybe even regular opportunities to, ser to serve. And we look at our life and we think, I don't see where I have the freedom or the opportunity to add anything else to my life. I mean, we're a busy culture. And it's not just us, it's all of the United States is busy. But particularly in our neighborhoods, in our area of life, we live in a big city and life is fast paced. So that's what I want us to talk about today. I want us to talk about how we might take advantage of the opportunities that Christ gives us to serve. How is it that we can put together, we can find time, we can carve out time, energy, resources to actually go forward and serve? And I'm going to be pointing you to our Serve Dallas Day on Saturday. That's going to be the primary thing I'm going to point you to. But hear me now, that's not the only way you can serve. But I'm going to be pointing you there primarily. We're going to be continuing on in our study of what's next. And this is kind of how life is after Easter. Can the experience that we had on Easter Sunday carry forward into the other days and other, other months that we have coming ahead. And so we started last week with Monday, because that was literally the next thing you were going to face. It was the day after, right? Now we're going to look at opportunities. What's next? Your next chance is an opportunity that you have. We're going to be in Galatians 5.1, uh, like Sarah said. We're going to bounce around a little in Galatians, uh, but mostly on the back, the back end of it. And we're going to see what gives us an opportunity and then what we are going to do with it. So first, we have an opportunity because we're freed up. We have an opportunity because we're freed up. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul is waging a war of liberation for the hearts and souls of the Galatian people. He's come in, he's planted churches in Galatia. Now, Galatia is not a city, it's a region in modern-day Turkey. And that is where uh, Paul's done some work. He's done some, some church planting, 
and he's taught them that, they, that they're saved by grace through faith, and he reminds them of that in uh, Galatians 2.16. They've been taught that this freedom was purchased for them by Christ's death because he took the punishment that they deserved, and he tells them that again in chapter 3, 13 through 14. The problem is they're trying to go back to being slaves. They're trying to go back to being slaves to the law. They're going back to a system where they believed you had to do certain things to earn the approval of God, and if you did the right things, then he would like you more, and if you did the wrong things, he would like you less. And in 5.1, Paul's reminding them, finally, you don't have to go back to that way of life. You don't have to go back to that. And the reason why they're going back to that is because teachers have come in behind Paul and told them that they need to become Jewish first before they can become Christians. And Paul says, no, 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 you don't need to do that. That's, that's not important anymore. What's important is that Christ has died for you. And so we'll live in that. And so before we start talking about serving and sacrificing and giving of limited resources that you already look at your life and you think, I don't know where I'm going to find time to do this, I want you to hear this above everything else that I tell you. You're free. You're free. If you never lift another finger to help another human being ever again, God will love you no less than he loves you right now. If you never do another thing for another human being. On the other hand, if you sell everything you have, you give it to the poor, and you become like one of those ascetic desert monk type peoples that we had kind of in the early church history, God will love you no more than he loves you today. You're free. This message is a message of encouragement. It's not a guilt trip. It's not a you ought to be serving or you're a bad Christian. That's not what you're supposed to hear today. And if that is what you hear, now again, there's a difference between feeling guilty and feeling conviction. But if that is what you hear today, I've either done a bad job or you're hearing me wrong. You're free. And you've been set free by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is all you need to do. That is all you need to have, really, in order to be accepted by God. Serving is important, but it's not so important that it earns you a relationship with Christ. So just relax. I want you to take a deep breath. Let it out. You're free. Relax. This is a message of encouragement. So we have this freedom that's been purchased for us by Jesus Christ. What do we do with it? Well, Paul tells us in, in verse 13, we really have two choices. We can use it for ourselves, or we can use it for other people. Let's look at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Now, he starts off by saying you've been called to freedom. That's a good reminder that we didn't earn our freedom. We didn't break ourselves out of bondage. Jesus Christ broke us out through his death, right? So we've been liberated, we've been set free, and we've been called to that freedom. Now, it's not an opportunity for the flesh. Now, what does that mean? That's kind of a weird saying. Uh, nobody hopefully raises their children and says, now, don't do that. That's an opportunity for the flesh. <laughs> Johnny, put that down. No, you don't say that. That's strange. So what is the word opportunity? Opportunity literally is a Greek word, and it means a staging area or a base camp for an expedition. It can also be a staging area for an attack, like an offensive that an army would go on. So what he's saying is your freedom becomes this sort of staging area, the, the ground from which you can make a set of actions. And it's not a staging area for you to indulge in things that are all about you and self-gratifying. On the other hand, it's actually a staging area for you to go and serve others. We want our freedom for ourselves. We want our freedom for us. That's the only way freedom really makes sense to us. We want our freedom for me. We want to use it for ourselves. We want it for our own comfort, our own pleasure, and our own advantage. That's what he means by the flesh. Because when we read the word the flesh, if you've been in church any length of time and you've spent time reading Paul's letters, the flesh just comes across as generic sin, right? Generic things that you do to displease God. At least that's how it comes across to me. But Paul's actually using the term as a specific term to talk about how we do things to gratify our own desires. So if I'm free... And we talked about this yesterday. We, our, our single adults had a, had a one-day retreat, and we talked about this envisioning the good life. Like, what does the good life look like? 
And if I have to be honest, the good life for me, if I had to picture a day where I could do anything I wanted, that amount of freedom where I had no commitments at all, 90% of that day is going to be spent with me, and that's probably me being generous. We like to use our freedom for ourselves. And the problem is when we use our freedom for ourselves and we get in a habit of doing it, it kind of becomes this monster that he talks about in verse 19 through 20. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That's kind of a, a counter to the fruits of the Spirit that he's going to talk about later. If we let our freedom run wild and let it just kind of be all about us, we keep turning inward and inward and inward and inward to the point where we become self-possessed. And I don't even think we realize we are doing it. And we put it all under this umbrella of, well, Christ set me free so I can do what I want. That's actually not a Christian perspective. That's kind of what our culture says today, right? Do whatever makes you feel good. So freedom is not an opportunity for me to indulge in my selfishness. What it is an opportunity for is for selflessness. Go back to 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now, we don't think of freedom this way. We don't think of freedom as an opportunity to then put myself under the authority and control and subservience of another person. That seems backwards to us. I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's because we live in a capitalistic kind of consumerist culture where they're, they're trying to sell me not items, but desires, right? If you've been in marketing or, or advertising uh, or you've seen a car commercial, they're not trying to sell you a Lexus, okay? They're trying to sell you a lifestyle that the Lexus can provide for you, okay? In the same way, we tend to not think of freedom as an opportunity for others, but for ourselves. And maybe we don't think that it's for other people because of the American dream. Trying to pursue, to work harder, to make life better for my kids. And there's a genetic component to that, right? I mean, simple biology says that we tend to do things instinctually, and I am more inclined to care for and love those who are of my tribe, of my people, that are biologically connected to me, and so I might sacrifice for my family, or I might sacrifice for people that look like me, or I might sacrifice for a people group that I identify with, like a state or a nation, but I'm not going to lay down my life for someone that has no connection to me at all, because we misunderstand what Christian freedom is for. Our freedom has been given to us by Christ to serve others, to love others. Think about that. You've been set free by the Lord to continue the mission of bringing the light of the gospel to other people. You've been set free so that you can liberate others. Anybody ever play chess? Got any chess people in here? You don't have to admit it, like, if you don't want to. There's no football players that are going to beat you up afterwards. <laughs> Promise. One of the great things about chess is uh, if you, you have these series of pieces called pawns. And if you move them across the board, and they, they're very unhelpful in a lot of ways, but if you get them across the board, and you get them to the very last rank or column of, of the board, you can exchange that pawn for another more valuable piece that was captured earlier on. So if you've lost your queen or you lost your bishop, and you're playing against somebody who doesn't really play chess that often, their goal is just to get the queen back, right? So they start moving these pawns to try and get their piece back. But when you rescue the queen or when you rescue the bishop or your knight or whatever piece you want back, that piece doesn't then get to go and do whatever it wants, right? Like, hey, thanks, pawn. I'm going to go and like, get a you know, coffee somewhere else, and you guys finish up the game, and we'll catch up later. No, the queen goes back into the battle. She goes back to work, and the game changes. You've been set free. At one time, you were a pawn, enslaved to move in only one direction. But through the grace of God and through the power of Christ and through his death, burial, and resurrection, you have been moved to the last rank in the board and you have been exchanged and made better and are even continued to be made better. You are greater than you could ever know because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. 
And when we call you to serve, when the church says come and serve, when Jesus says to lay down your life for others, you're the piece going back on the board. You're back in the game. You're back in the battle. And so we're fighting, just like Paul, a war of liberation for the hearts and lives of other people through service. You don't get to sit this one out because that's not what your freedom is for. Your freedom is yours. Don't mishear me. It is yours to do with what you want and go back to the message of grace that I said earlier. But your freedom is an opportunity to fight to bring the light of the gospel to people that don't have it. Let's not turn it inward and waste it on ourselves. Let's give it to others. Because our freedom becomes greater when we share it in service to others. C.K. Barrett says this, the opposite of flesh is love. Love that looks away from the self and its wishes, even its real needs, to the neighbor and spends its resources on his needs. Even his needs, even its real needs. So we've been freed up to serve other people, right? That sounds great. What do we do with that? Well, we have an opportunity, so let's show up. We have an opportunity, so show up. Skip down with me all the way to verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We have an opportunity, we should show up. So why do we show up? Why is it so important that that we do this right now? Why is this so urgent, Travis? Is it just because we have a thing on Saturday and you're trying to drum up volunteers for that? No. We have an opportunity because our time is short. Our time is short. Look at verse 10 again. So then, as we have opportunity, the Greek word there for opportunity is a different one than the staging area that was in the previous verse we looked at. The word is kairos, and it means an appointed time, a certain season, a window of opportunity, really, is probably the best way to think about it in this context. It means that for us to serve and work and love and encourage other people, we have a narrow window. There's only a certain amount of time that we have. And this window is the opportunity that we have until Christ returns. Until Christ returns, the church has a responsibility and indeed the joy of reaching out beyond our walls and bringing more people into the fold and meeting their needs. Your time to make a difference in this world is short. Currently, if you're lucky, you might get 80 years or 90 years. Some of us won't make it that long. But I have never heard a story of somebody on their deathbed saying to themselves, man, I wish I would have just taken more time for me. You know? I wish I would have taken all those opportunities that I had where I was serving other people, and I wish I would have just spent a little bit more time, I don't know, getting a manicure. That would have been great. Or a pedicure. And guys can get those too, apparently. I wish I would have been more relaxed. No, you have people on their deathbed all the time being like, I wish I would have given more away. Anybody see the movie Schindler's List? It's one of my favorite films. It might be my favorite film. And at the very end, Schindler has gone through and he's bought uh, out of slavery uh, a number of Jews in concentration camps, and he's put them to work in his factory to save them. And as he's leaving, he's trying to escape the advancing Allied armies because they're going to treat him as a war criminal. And every Jewish person he's rescued is there, and, and they're kind of sending him off. And he, he just breaks down, and he starts weeping. And he pulls off this pin that has the, the swastika on it, and he says, I could have sold this, and I could have bought one more. And then he goes to his car, and he's like, I could have sold this, and I could have bought four more. I could have done so much more. Now, Oscar Schindler, if you watch the whole film, was not a great man. He was not a good man, even. But he understood grace. And he understood the value of giving up things to gain people. Your time is short. Your resources are few. Your connect group, if you're a part of a connect group, has probably already signed up to serve somewhere on Saturday. Start there. I point you there because it's the next opportunity that you have to really all of us get together as a church and serve. If you don't know where your connect group is serving, find out. Contact your teacher or leader. They probably know. If you don't know anything, if you aren't connected at all, there's a table in the commons. They're giving away t-shirts that you can wear on Saturday. Go and ask Jessica, hey, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to serve, but I want to use my freedom to serve others because my time is short. 
can you, can you point me in the right direction? And she'll help you. Jessica might be the most helpful person on our staff. She's awesome. So we show up because the time is short. We also show up because the time is, the, the needs are many. Go back to verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. Paul is talking about every single person here. There's not a, a caveat. There's not a, no, these people, but not the, them. Why do we serve everybody? Why is Paul wanting us to do good to everyone? You have to go all the way back to Genesis 1. Everybody's made in the image of God, therefore everybody deserves to be served sacrificially. If you can find a person who is not created in the image of God, congratulations, you don't have to help them. That is, you have my permission. But there's going to be a problem with that. Every human being is made in the image of God. And not just that, every human being has had their sins paid for by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If they believe, right? They put their hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So the fact that Jesus was willing to die so that all men might know him probably means I should be willing to give up a Saturday here and there or a weekend or a Friday or a Wednesday night or whatever it is that's being asked of me. I should be willing to do that too. Again, not out of guilt, but out of worship. Not out of guilt, because I'm trying to, but I'm trying to be like Jesus. That's the purpose of coming to Christ, is being made more into the image of his son. And so if Jesus was willing to lay down all the trappings and comfort of heaven to come to earth, then I should probably be willing to leave the comforts of my own home and go and serve in places that I wouldn't normally go. That's just a, a, an easy, logical conclusion. Everybody has needs, and as the people of God, we need to be the first in line to help them. And it actually is beneficial for us as well. Because it helps me get my mind off my own problems, my own issues, the, own, the, the, the things I'm dealing with. That's one way it helps. It also keeps the evils of racism, bigotry, classism, elitism away from my heart. Because if I'm going and I'm serving and I'm helping people that probably don't look like me, it's going to be real hard for me to have issues with that group of people because I know them. I have, there's a face on them. It's not just this group of people, but there's a person now involved. Everybody has needs. The needs are many. The time is short. But we also show up because of the family of faith. Look at verse 10 one last time. Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We show up because of the family of faith. Now, Paul is saying this because when people came to Christ in his day and age, often they had to leave the pagan temple worship that was going on if they were Gentiles, or they had to move from being good Jews to being kind of a renegade Jew, because at that point, uh, Christianity was kind of seen as a, a subset of Judaism. And so it's very possible that they could have left behind every sort of support system that they had. And now the only people that they have to count on anymore are the people in their church. So we do good, especially to those in the family of faith. So the people of God, the family of faith, those are the people that are our partners. We have a lot of partners as a church. We have uh, folks in Cor at Cornerstone. We have folks in Vickery. We have Brothers Build. We have ACT over in West Dallas, and all these people do amazing things, but we're not partners with them just because they're doing amazing things. We don't go around and find ministries and we're like, all right, who's doing it the best? Let's only be friends with them. We're partners with them because they're a part of the family of faith. We go to those places because they're family, and they have needs, and I would no more ignore the needs of my spiritual family than it would the needs of my wife and daughter. And you would say the same. These people, these organizations are family. And they need our help. We are so closely connected. Their hurts are our hurts. Their wins are our wins. Their needs are our needs. We need to do good, especially to the family of faith. Because they are us, and we are them. And we've all been bought with the blood of Christ. And so we go and serve. We show up because the time is short, the needs are many, and our brothers are already in the battle. So let's pick up and go. Let's not sit it out. So we're motivated, right? We've been freed up. We have liberation. We've been put back into the game, and we recognize that we need to show up for that because there's a whole host of reasons why we need to do that. So why don't we? Or why do we quit? Why do we give up? 
We have an opportunity, so don't give up. Jump back one verse and look at verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if, in, if we do not give up. We all agree that serving is a good thing. Even the most base human being, even, even the most ardent atheist, will look at someone who is serving and say, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. I would like to be more helpful. So why is it that we don't do that more? Why don't we serve more? I think one of the things that we do is we get tired. Look at verse 9 again. And let us not grow weary of doing good. Now, in the English language, we use tired in two ways. And I think that's a, a helpful way at looking at one of the reasons why we give up. We get tired in the traditional sense. We just get tired of pushing. We get tired of working. We get worn down. And so we, we take a step back. Because it seems like there's always a need, right? There's always something. No matter how much you chip away at homelessness in Dallas, Texas, the odds are homelessness will still exist in Dallas, Texas, because we live in a fallen world. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm just saying likelihood. And some people see that and they think, well, why should I even bother? The task is too daunting, it's too big, and we quit before we even get started. When I was in uh, high school, I thought about going to West Point. I was really excited about West Point. I was going to go and be an officer because at the time, all my heroes were West Point graduates. I was a military history nerd. And I got the packet of information that came through, and, and it started telling me all the things that the West Point graduate, uh, a West Point uh, person was in high school. It's like 30% valedictorians, 25% salutatorians, 85% uh, captain of their football team or sports team, you know, all this stuff, class presidents. And I looked at that list and I thought, I'm none of those things. And so I didn't apply at all. And it was largely because of those statistics. I didn't think I was West Point material. I was probably right, if I had to be honest. <laughs> but I had a friend who I told that to, and she said, you got intimidated and you quit. Like you gave up on it because you got intimidated. We get intimidated by the needs that are around us. And so we get tired. Or it's possible that something happens in our lives and we have to take a step back. There's a health problem. There's a, there's a need in our family. There's something that takes place and we have to take a step back. And so we do. And that's fine. That's good. Because sometimes we do need to take a knee. Hear me. If you're getting burned out in service, take a step back. Relax. The problem is, though, we get addicted to the relaxation. We start turning more inward on ourselves, and we never really pick serving back up again. Sometimes I go running with my daughter, and she's 19 months, so she rides in the stroller uh, <laughs> because she can't keep up, right? <laughs> I'm learning that I really can't keep up with her based on how tired I am at the end of my days. But I put her in a stroller, and I, and I hook her up with, like, some goldfish in one of those cups, you know, that has, like, can't get out and then a sippy cup as well. And so while I'm running, we're going, and every once in a while, this cup like goes flying, right? <laughs> and I have to stop, and I have to pick up the cup. And depending on where I am at in my run, it's really hard to get started again because I had momentum. I was going. And I find that that happens to us in service. If we have to stop for any reason, we get out of a rhythm, and it's really hard to pick that up because, man, sleeping in on Sunday morning feels really good right now. If you need to take a break, take a break. I'm totally on board with that but we need to be mindful about how we might start up again before we take that break. We also get tired of doing the same things. This is language that we may not use that much anymore, but something is tired when it's old, right? So if I complimented you on a shirt or a, or a blouse that you had on, you would say, oh, this tired old thing, right? You don't really think, you appreciate the compliment, but you might say it as a way to say something is old. We have this thing in our culture now where we value novelty almost as much as we value our freedom. And so when something is new, it's exciting and interesting, and when something is old, we kind of tune it out. There's actually a word for this. It's called compassion fatigue. And they've discovered it first in the 1950s with doctors and nurses who were treating trauma patients. And they treated so many trauma patients that their compassion, their reflex of looking at the person who's broken and trying to put them back together, and it became more like a puzzle. They were kind of distanced from it rather than caring about the person. 
They still did their job, but it was just a unique phenomenon. And people believe that nowadays we have compassion fatigue because every single day you turn on the news, you open up something on the internet, you come to church, you get bombarded with images and pictures of people in need, and you're like, I've seen it before. It doesn't resonate with us because we've seen it so much. That's called compassion fatigue. We get tired of the same old thing. And so when we're up here and we mention our partners, or we mention a serve day, or we mention going to South Texas or Guatemala, you think to yourself, oh, I've heard that already, and then you tune out. It's an automatic reflex. You can't necessarily help it unless you're paying attention to it. So don't give up because you're tired. Do not give up because you're tired. If you're, if you're getting worn down, absolutely take a break. But contact the ministry leader that is in charge of where you're serving and say, hey, I need to take a step back. There's some health things going on, or, or I'm just in a season where I need to focus on my family. Fine. But give that person permission to call you in about two months and say, hey, are you, how, how are things going? Are you ready to get back in? Or you tell, them, tell yourself, I'm going to mark it on my calendar. I'm going to call them in two months and give them an update. Or one month or a week or whatever it is that you need. It's okay to take a break. It's not okay just to stay on break forever. If you're tired because the task is too large and you're a little intimidated by it, again, to talk to somebody. Talk to our partners about how we're making a difference. How does going and doing this really make a big difference in the grand scheme of things? And odds are someone will be able to tell you. And if they can't, they'll give you an answer. And lastly, don't give up because of compassion fatigue. Being tired is fine. Being tired of our partners is not. Being tired of one another is not okay. Being tired is okay. Commit yourself when you hear about an opportunity. You don't necessarily have to go. Guess what? Some of you already have committed plans on Saturday that you can't break right now. I get that. I'm a big fan of commitment. Keep those plans. But what you should do is when you wake up on Saturday morning, your church family is going to be out in the city serving. Before you do anything on Saturday morning, please commit to at least hit your knees and pray. And to pray for our people serving. Everybody can do that. Make a note in your phone. Make an alarm. You don't have to wake up early, just when you wake up. Pray for your people. Pray for your family that's out serving. We also give up because we don't see the reward. Look at verse 9 again. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Paul tells us that one of the reasons is we fail to see any kind of reward in our service. Timothy George says, one of the greatest frustrations in the Christian ministry and a principal cause for weariness in well-doing is the inability to calculate the spiritual outcome of faithful labors to the work of the Lord. Guys, we don't see when things are going well. We don't see when things are going poorly. We don't see that we're making an impact, and so we think, I don't really know why we're doing this. What's the point? So we lose sight of the payoff, both the immediate reward and the long-term eternal reward. Now, throughout Galatians, especially in the last part here, Paul is using a reaping and sowing metaphor, a farming metaphor that we haven't read. And he's kind of going back to it by saying, we will reap. He's picking it back up again. Now, no farmer is foolish enough to plant a seed in the ground one day, go back in his home, sleep on it, and then walk out and get angry because he doesn't have like an ear of corn there waiting on him. That would be a bad farmer. Because there's seasons and times, and if you take care of something, and if everything goes well, typically you have a crop and a fruit. Serving spiritually is not always that way. Doing ministry is not always how that works. Sometimes we serve for years and years and years, and it seems like nothing happens. There's many stories of missionaries in India going and giving their whole lives to something and never having a convert for years. That can happen to us. But we get so focused on immediate results because we live in a culture of the immediate that we get bogged down and we get disturbed and we give up. I wish that our immediate results were concrete more often. Sometimes they are. Sometimes we have baptisms or salvations or somebody gives you a smile and it's great, but often it's not like that. Sometimes you affect somebody in a new way. When we were in South Texas in March, Travis Durham was helping a, a man with his home put in drywall. And the man was actually, that's what he did for a living, he did drywall. And we found out that that man was so affected by people coming into his home and serving him that he was then going to go and help a friend get his home ready as well. That's an immediate result, an immediate reward. But we also lose sight 
of an eternal reward too. This is what Paul means by, again, in due season. It's the same word that we had for opportunity. It's kairos, again. There's coming a time when every worker will receive his or her wages. And we think that I should get wages regularly because that's how our culture is, every two weeks or every month or whatever it is that you get. But serving Christ is not like getting a paycheck regularly. Serving Christ is like putting money away in a 401k. It's there, and you will get it at the end. And it's tax-free, which is good. So as you go and serve, you're actually storing up rewards in this eternal sort of 401k or 403b if you're in a nonprofit like me. That's all I know about finance. Literally, I just <laughs> laid it all out there for you. We have been freed to care for others. And there is reward in it. You don't always get to see it. That's where faith comes in. And then from there, that's where faithfulness comes in. There are rewards, and it's okay to be excited about it. Jesus talks about it a lot. But if that's all you're basing it on, you'll give up. You've been freed up. You've been freed up to love others, to not just serve your own needs. So show up. Show up because the needs are many. Our brothers are already in the fight, and the time is short. Get in there. Get in the game. And don't give up. Don't give up because you get tired. Don't give up because you don't see a reward. There's an opportunity on Saturday, the first of hopefully many in your lives to serve. Take your family, even if you can only come for a little bit of time, do it, and let's do it together. There's some information about the Serve Dallas Day there on the screen, and so you can write some notes on there. But again, if you have questions, you can come see us in the Next Steps area. It's back that way. We would love to talk to you about how you can serve. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this day, because we have this day, we are we're in the staging area. We have freedom and we're ready to move. We're ready as a people to go and to serve throughout this city and throughout this world. And our hearts are ready because you've been making them ready our whole lives for this opportunity. And so God, I pray that we would show up. I pray that we would look around Dallas and see those blue shirts everywhere of men and women from this church serving in our city and showing Dallas, Texas that we love it and we care about it. I pray that we would not give up, that we would not grow weary of doing good, but that we would sacrifice so that we might rescue others from the clutches of bondage that they find themselves in, whatever those addictions or difficulties might be. I pray that we would be rescuers like our king. And I pray all this in his name. Amen.